Um, hello, folks. Uh, my name is Nelson Brown, and as a board member of the Peace Education Center of Greater Lansing, I want to welcome you to this presentation by Dr. Shireen Aladimi, entitled The Six-Year War in Yemen, Background, Humanitarian Crisis, and Possibilities. The Peace Education Center is working to educate people about the plight of the Yemeni people and to mobilize support for, from our senators and representatives, not just to end American military support, uh, for Saudi Arabia's devastating war there, but also to urge the United States to broker some type of resolution to the conflict and to provide humanitarian aid for the long-suffering Yemeni people. Just a little background on the Peace Education Center. We were founded in the late 60s to oppose the Vietnam War by mobilizing resistance to it in the Lansing area. During our over 50-year history, the Peace Center has worked on issues of war and peace, on opposing religious prejudice, on supporting economic and social justice at home and abroad, and on opposing American military interventions as a focus of American foreign policy. In particular, the Peace Center has consistently worked to reduce unnecessary military spending and to limit the military's overwhelming influence in the economic, social, and political cultural life of our country. These resources should better be spent on America's domestic needs including on reducing income inequality, on creating racial justice, on building infrastructure, and on preventing climate change. Among the Peace Center's accomplishment was the successful campaign to have Michigan State University divest any holdings it had with apartheid South Africa. After 9-11, the Peace Center opposed American mil military intervention in Afghanistan and the invasion of Iraq. We have supported an American return to the Iranian nuclear deal, the JCPOA. We've also opposed President Trump's motion uh, to ban Muslims and have supported justice for the Palestinian people. We work with other groups in the Lansing area that share our overlapping concerns. We wish to offer, offer special thanks to the co-sponsors of Dr. Aldini's presentation, Edgewood United Church Justice and Peace Team, Friends Committee on National Legislation, Lansing Area Advocacy Team, Greater Lansing Network Against War and Injustice, the Greater Lansing United Nations Association, the Islamic Center of East Lansing, and MSU Students United for Palestinian Rights. I now want to turn the program over to my fellow board member, Becky Payne, who will introduce Dr. Aladimi. Good evening, everyone. It is so wonderful to see so many people here. Uh, thank you for all for sh uh, showing up. Um, a quarter million deaths, three million people displaced. Just a few statistics on the crisis in Yemen. Also, on the United States, the United States is responsible for 37% of arms sales around the globe. It's hard to understand and to care about places so far away, but we must. We at the Peace Education Center are happy when we can bring someone to speak to, for us who can bring us up to speed on what our country is doing and how we need to lobby for justice. Dr. Shireen Aladimi is an expert on the war and humanitarian crisis in her country of birth, Yemen, and has been advocating for an end to U.S. involvement there since 2015. She writes for several publications in these times and has been featured on NBC, NPR, PRI, The New York Times, Al Jazeera, The Nation, Current Affairs, and among others. She is an assistant professor of language and literacy at Michigan State University, where her research focuses on dialogic talk and student outcomes. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Shireen Aladimi. Thank you so much, Becky and Nelson and Tahseen for inviting me. It's a pleasure to speak with you all today. And thank you so much to all the attendees who are making time on this, um, is it Tuesday afternoon, <laughs> evening? <laughs> all right. I'm gonna share my screen with you um, and go through this presentation. And I just wanna note that um, I'm gonna be talking about kind of the background, the country overview, overview um, I'll discuss the nature and the extent of the Saudi and the U.S. intervention. I'll go over the humanitarian crisis and then as well as talking about ending U.S. complicity. And I just want to note that all of the photos or most of the photos that I have here of Yemen are from this account on Twitter um, called Beautiful Yemen, in case people want to check it out. Um, 
so some demographic background. Yemen is the country where most Arabs uh, originate from. And so it's the ethnic origin of, of um, Arabs. And the predominant language is Arabic, but also some languages that are South Semitic languages like Mihri and Sokhatri. Um, the population as of 2020 is 30 million people. And um, most are Muslim. And I highlight the uh, sectarian uh, breakdown here, 60% Sunni Shafi'i and about 40% Zaydi Shia. And I highlight this distinction because you can see that this is not a country where it's only a very tiny majority Shia population. Um, it's a unique kind of form of Shia Islam and Yemenis have coexisted along religious lines for a millennia. So it's not, um, you know, this is not a, a sectarian uh, war as, as it's sometimes um, presented as such. The history of Yemen spans at least 3000 years where it was the home of the kingdom of Seba or Sheba in the Bible. Um, and it's the home of the ancient dam of Ma'rib, which was built in the 8th century BC. And this picture here at the bottom is a version of what remains of the dam. Uh, and this photo up here is the so-called, um, you know, temple of the Queen of Sheba. And Yemen was really important in the frankincense trail, which lasted from about 1000 BC to 700 AD, which supplied basically um, the frankincense and myrrh to the Parthian and Roman empires. And at the time, the Greeks call it Arabia Felix because it was such a prosperous country. Now, talking about some modern divisions, you'll notice that sometimes Yemen is um, spoken about in terms of North and South Yemen. And so I wanna highlight a map over here. North Yemen is this area in uh, orange and South Yemen uh, or the former South and the former North this area in green is the South Yemen. And basically North Yemen with the capital in Sana'a was under the rule of the Ottoman Empire until 1918. And then it was ruled by the Mutwakalite Kingdom of Yemen. This was a Zaydi Kingdom, which lasted until 1962 when a military coup outstid the monarchy. Um, this led to several years of war. And at the time, Saudi Arabia, which is another monarchy, um, and Jordan and even um, the United Kingdom supported the monarchists against the military coup. But ultimately the coup uh, created the Yemen Arab Republic, which lasted from 1962 to 1990. Meanwhile, in South Yemen, with its capital Bihir Aden, where I was born, um, it was under British rule from 1839 until 1967 and Resistance to British rule eventually led to the withdrawal of UK forces and the creation of the Middle East to date only Marxist country, which was called the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen. And this lasted from 1967 until 1990. So what happened in 1990 was, you know, the Soviet Union was about to collapse, which was the predominant supporter of the South. Um, and the unity talks, which were long held between North and South, basically were prioritized during this time. And the Republic of Yemen was formed in 1990 as a presidential constitutional republic. And I highlight this again because it's unlike the neighboring countries, which are, you know, the Sultanate of Oman or the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates or Kuwait or Qatar. These are all kingdoms or monarchies, whereas Yemen is a constitutional republic. And Saleh, President Ali Abdullah Saleh, presided over northern Yemen from 1978 until 1990, and then a unified Yemen in 1990 until 2012. This is a picture of Saleh uh, uniting with um, the southern president. Unfortunately, unity didn't last very long. And in um, 1994, just four years after the uh, unity between North and South. The South declared secession and Saleh waged war. Um, my family and I lived through that war. It was a summer war. It was very brutal, but it, he essentially tried to force the South back into unity with the North. And there are various reasons why the South wanted to, to declare secession. We can talk about that if, if people are interested later. Um, the other turmoil, the other kind of challenge to Saleh's rule happened between 2004 and 2010 when the Houthis, which are, you know, a group from northern Yemen, uh, began to challenge Saleh's corruption and his rule. And he responded again with war. And there were six wars waged between the Yemeni government and the Houthis between 2004 and 2010, 
Now, he enlisted the Saudi military cooperation during those wars. And so there's a history of Houthis and Saudis fighting one another. Um, in 2007, Southern leaders from Al-Hiraq Al-Janubi, uh, it's a secessionist movement. They kind of formed themselves into this group and renewed calls for uh, secession of the South. And then by 2011, as you uh, may know, the Yemeni revolution occurred in the context of the wider Arab Spring. And so here we have a country that was only united in 1990. And by 2010, 2011, there were already all of these, um, you know, kind of challenges, as well as Yemen being the poorest Middle Eastern country at the time. Saleh was, it was no secret that he was highly corrupt. And so people were uh, frustrated by this and began to go out in the streets peacefully to demonstrate. So the peaceful protests were joined, um, you know, people from the Hiraq, the Southern Secessionist Movement, as well as the Houthis had joined these protests because, you know, factions, basically anybody who was anti-Saleh was joining these protests that began as peaceful protests. By March, um, violent clashes began to uh, occur between Saleh and his former allies and uh, peaceful protesters were killed during this time. Um, and between June and February of the next year, um, Saleh survived uh, an assassination attempt and he, you know, flew to Saudi Arabia. He was a strong Saudi ally and, um, you know, was treated over there. And then when he came back, he agreed to transfer power to his vice president, Hadi, who is the current UN recognized president of Yemen. He had been Saleh's VP since 1994 and power was officially transferred to him in uh, February of 2012. Hadi was appointed to a two-year term, so he was never elected. It was, they call it a one-man election, but really he was just appointed to a two-year term. And this time he was um, tasked with revamping the constitution, bringing all of the groups together, like the Houthis, like the Hiraq, and so on. Uh, but this Gulf country negotiated deal kind of left out groups like Hiraq and the Houthis and gave Saleh the power to just resign, but remain the most powerful man in Yemen. So large factions of the Yemeni army remained loyal to him. He was not going to be tried for, you know, any, any corruption or killing protesters or anything like that. He remained the most powerful man in Yemen, uh, unlike other Arab Spring presidents. So this was kind of a unique deal that suited him very well. So what happened in 2014 was um, the Houthis began to call for mass protests in August of 2014 after the Hadi government, which now by now had been in power for a couple of years, um, they removed fuel subsidies. And so this began, this of course affected Yemenis everywhere, not just the Houthis. And by September, after a series of armed clashes between jihadists that were aligned with the Islah party of Yemen, uh, the Houthis essentially took over the capital Sana'a and the Yemeni army, which was largely allied to Saleh, interestingly, did not intervene, despite the long history of war between Saleh and the Houthis. Um, despite the turmoil, they were able to sign a UN-sponsored unity deal with Hadi's government. So there was still, you know, things were looking pretty bad, but there was still some hope that Yemenis were going to sort things out on their own, as they had, had done in previous uh, decades. In January of 2015, the Houthis continued to apply pressure to Hadi, and this time they took over the presidential palace and they uh, put him under house arrest. Um, and as a result, he resigned. And in the context of all of this, the Saudis began bombing. And I want to highlight a quote from Jamal bin Omar. He was the former UN Special Envoy to Yemen, and he published this piece in Newsweek um, just last month where he said, after 10 painful weeks, a compromise was found covering the shape of the executive and legislature, security arrangements and a timetable for transition. A deal was on the table. Two days later, with no warning, the airstrikes began. And here he is talking about the Saudi-led coalition and the airstrikes that began in March of 2015, almost six years ago. So Saudi Arabia began this intervention with the support of the Hadi government. Interestingly, Saleh and the Houthis ended up joining forces to defend Yemen against the Saudi-led intervention. So in January 2015, um, this is a picture of Mohammed bin Salman, or he's often called MBS, uh, as well as President Hadi. 
Um, in 2015, Mohammed bin Salman became the defense minister of Saudi Arabia, as well as the deputy crown prince. He's since promoted himself to crown prince. Um, and in, by March, he led this intervention in Yemen. And it was very brutal. Like Jamal bin Omar said, it, it kind of came out of nowhere. The airstrikes came out of nowhere. And the Saudi-led coalition, um, they kind of put together a coalition of countries, including themselves, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar was involved in this until June of 2017 when they had that you know, big spat with Saudi Arabia and they were kicked out of the coalition. Uh, Bahrain, Kuwait, and then Morocco also left the coalition in February of 2019. And then Egypt, Sudan, and Senegal. So these are the countries that are officially part of the Saudi-led coalition. The ground troops are not Saudi or Emirati. They are Saudi-paid Yemeni troops and mercenaries. Um, there are UAE-backed uh, mercenaries that were are, that are employed by um, what was then called Blackwater and is now called uh, Academy. And this is the Eric Prince run uh, mercenary firm, essentially, that's currently based in the UAE. And the Yemeni government continues to support them. So this is the Saudi backed Hadi government, the Salah Party of Yemen. And interestingly, the UAE is supporting the Southerners, the Southern secessionists. And so even though the goal is to restore the UN recognized president of Yemen and to create a you know, united Yemen, the UAE is supporting uh, and backing the um, Southern secessionists. So US complicity in Yemen um, involves many things, but I first wanna highlight, you, know, you might be wondering why, why Yemen? I said it was the Middle East poorest country, not much oil to, to speak of, why Yemen? Uh, well, Yemen controls the strategic location. It's Bab el Mandeb Strait right here. And this is where in 2018, 6.2 million barrels of oil and oil products travel per day north to Europe and the US through the Suez Canal and south to Asia. And so this has always been a strategic location. And interestingly, China doesn't have, you know, the US has over 800, 800 bases around the world. China's only base is on the other side of Bab el-Mandeb in Djibouti. And it was uh, you know, built basically in 2017, two years into the war. So it's a strategic location. And there is a long history of Saudi intervention in Yemen that we can talk about. Um, you know, Saudi basically has always maintained some kind of, not some kind of, a lot of influence in Yemen's government. And with the rise of the Houthis, they were starting to feel like that you know, control was no longer gonna be viable. So we often hear about arms sales. Um, so, you know, quote unquote, $110 billion in Saudi arms sales were um, sold under, sorry, that should say Trump. The top right, 110 should say Trump. Uh, and I have it in quotes because we don't actually know the exact figure. Trump likes to boast about it. Um, but, you know, we, I'm not actually quite sure what the figure is, but at least $115 billion in arms sales under the Obama administration. And this is just from 2015 onwards. So. Um, right when the war began. Arms sales are not the only way that the Saudis, that the U.S. is involved in Yemen. Um, since 2015, the U.S. has been training soldiers and pilots, as well as advising um, Saudi and UAE military personnel. The U.S. maintains and repairs vehicles and aircrafts, whether they were sold to the Saudi-led coalition by the U.S. or not. They supply about 70% of Saudi's weapons. Um, the U.S. provides targeting assistance with commanders actually present in the command room choosing targets and helping them choose targets. Until November of 2018, the U.S. was providing mid-air refueling to the Saudi-led coalition. So as a plane would be flying over Yemeni airspace, um, a U.S. jet would refuel them mid-air because there's no way to land, of course, without being in danger. So they were providing this to, to Saudi um, and UAE jets that were bombing Yemen. They provide all sorts of logistical support and intelligence sharing, which the Biden administration announced an end to just last month. And importantly, the U.S., um, although they've neither, neither confirmed nor denied a, a recent CNN investigation, um, more likely than not is involved in imposing a naval blockade on Yemen. And I'll talk more about the blockade. So in 2016, this is a year into the war, um, a UN, a leaked UN report said that the targeting of the civil, of civilians by the Saudi-led coalition was, quote, widespread and systematic. 
So I kind of want to break down what, what it means to, to have a systematic targeting of civilians. So in the first couple of in the first couple of days of the war in March of 2015, the Saudi-led coalition essentially um, destroyed the entire Yemeni air force, and that's why the other side, the Houthis, currently they don't have um, an air force. Um, then they began to target very quickly civilian areas, including hospitals and homes and schools and mosques and factories and gatherings like funerals or weddings or markets, even moving vehicles. So all civilian targets became legitimate targets for the Saudi-led coalition. Um, the coalition then began targeting food and water facilities like food production facilities, plants, um, you know, agriculture, and also you know, infrastructure that would provide transportation for you know, those um, foods like roads and bridges just began destroying them. Now, in April of 2014, just a month into the war, a UN Security Council resolution 2216 essentially acknowledged and recognized the intervention and explicitly called on the Saudi-led coalition to inspect all cargo coming to Yemen via sea and land in order to prevent um, arms transfers to the Houthis. There was a big concern that Iran was going to be supplying arms to the Houthis. Now, what happened essentially is um, that gave reason for the Saudis to impose this blockade. Currently, there are all but two airports in the country that are open. They're both in the southern part of the country that the Saudi-led coalition kind of controls. Commercial trade is severely limited and restricted. This led to 80% of Yemenis becoming reliant on aid because prior to the war, 90% relied on importing food. We used to import 90% of our food into Yemen. And so when commercial trade was severely restricted and limited, um, you know, most of the population became, became reliant on aid. Um, that too is used as uh, a weapon by the Saudi-led coalition and by the Trump administration who cut aids to various parts of Northern Yemen. So essentially under the guise of an arms embargo to the Houthis, the Saudi-led coalition is still using 2216 to justify their blockade in Yemen. This is a tweet from this morning. Um, Martin Griffiths, who's the current envoy to Yemen, he said, fuel import imports haven't entered Hodeida. This is a port in the northern part of Yemen, um, which supplies 70% of Yemen's needs. Haven't entered the port of Hodeida since January. It's vital that obstacles to imports and domestic distribution of fuel for civilian use are removed. I call on the parties to prioritize civilian needs above all else and not to weaponize the economy. And David Beasley, who is the um, director of the World Food Program, also this month said, to add to all their misery, the innocent people of Yemen have to deal with the fuel blockade. For example, most hospitals only have electricity in their intensive care units because fuel reserves are so low. I know this firsthand because I've walked in the hospital and the lights were off, the electricity was off. The people of Yemen deserve our help that blockade must be lifted as a humanitarian act. Otherwise, millions more will spiral into crisis. So this is in no uncertain terms saying that the blockade exists, that it needs to be lifted. Um, and yet, after a CNN investigation this past week, showing that famine is created in Yemen and it's you know fueled by this um, Saudi blockade that the US is supporting, the the um, Biden envoy to Yemen, Tim Lenderking, outright denied the existence of a blockade. Um, you know, the reporter who went to Yemen, she smuggled herself into Yemen, the CNN reporter, uh, Naima al-Bagir, she um, smuggled herself into Yemen to report what was happening in Yemen. And she names names and calls out the US for its complicity in starving Yemen. She described it as hell on earth for Yemeni children. And despite this, the new envoy to Yemen is denying the existence even of the blockade. Um, there are some images uh, ahead that um, are distressing if you want to look away. The UN has been calling this the world's worst humanitarian crisis. This is mostly driven by the blockade, but of course also the bombing. 112,000 people have been killed in the violence, um, and these are most likely underestimates because there's not a clear way of understanding the full impact of this war. 50% are on the brink of starvation. This year, um, 400,000 children 
under the age of five are going to starve to death if the war continues and if the blockade continues. So there are 3.6 million people who are internally displaced and not a lot of Yemeni refugees because essentially they're stuck in the country due to the blockade. 70% don't have access to adequate health care and clean drinking water. So epidemics like cholera became um, widespread and the cholera outbreaks in Yemen, four different outbreaks, are the worst in modern history. 80%, like I mentioned before, which is 24 million people, are in need of humanitarian assistance. A child between the ages of birth and five dies every 10 minutes. And so if you count that up, that's at least 210,000 children in just four years out of the six years of the war. Half of all children suffer stunted growth because when a child starves to death, um, when a child survives starvation, if, if they don't die, um, it has significant effect on their cognitive and physical health. And even though COVID cases are very low, because again, the healthcare system is all but, but decimated, we know that um, the case fatality rate of the cases that have been confirmed is 30%, which is the highest in the world. So there have been efforts to end US complicity in the war in Yemen. First, the US war in Yemen is illegal. So I talked about the humanitarian crisis, but even if we don't talk about, about this on moral grounds, it's illegal um, given US law. So the war, war Powers Act of 1973 was introduced after news of Nixon's secret bombing of Cambodia was leaked to journalists. And it led to this federal law that authorizes Congress and not the president to declare war. And so when Obama entered this war in 2016 without congressional approval, that was an illegal act. But basically every president since Nixon has entered illegal wars and Congress has never challenged a sitting president on a, on a war um, using the War Powers Act until 2019, where under the re leadership of Representative Ro Khanna in the House and Bernie Sanders in the Senate, this took a couple of years to go through various obstacles. Um, Congress passed its first War Powers Act in, 19, in 2019 um, declaring that Trump should withdraw all U.S. support for the war in Yemen. And what did Trump do? He vetoed the bill. So Biden has since made certain promises. So I have a table here. Um, I tried to organize this and I thought maybe a table would be helpful. So on the left, you'll see what Biden has done so far. So, so far he's lifted the FTO designation against the Houthis. On the very last day of the Trump administration, they imposed a terror designation on the Houthis as a way to kind of appease Saudi Arabia, but this would have caused literally 70% of the population to starve because the Houthis control an area in Northern Yemen where 70% of the population lives. And if you designate the de facto government of Yemen as, um, as um, terrorists, then no, organizations are going to be able to work in those areas or provide aid. Um, and so thankfully, the Biden administration was very quick to lift this designation that should have never happened. And they said that this was, in fact, a misuse of the designation. The Trump administration also cut aid to northern Yemen in August, again, where 70 percent of the population lives. And they tried to influence the UN to also cut aid in those areas. Um, Biden, in the last couple of days, has restored aid to northern Yemen. He also announced an end to intelligence sharing with the Saudi-led coalition. And there was this um, you know, talk that he gave to the um, secretary department where he talked about ending offensive operations in Yemen and reviewing relevant arms sales to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. What I'm terming here business as usual essentially is the Biden administration continuing to enforce the naval blockade. Again, they've not denied that the US Navy is involved in enforcing the naval blockade. Um, they continue to support the Saudi-led coalition in their actions against the Houthis in areas like Ma'rib in Northern Yemen and other battlefronts. They continue to provide spare parts, other logistical support and training and advising of Saudi and UAE military personnel. They were, the Saudis were just, uh, the Saudi Air Force was just kind of tweeting about um, joint exercises between the US um, Army and um, the US Air Force and the Saudi Air Force just this month. So what next? Biden has promised that he will end offensive operations, but we don't know if um, 
we don't know what that means, right? Um, the reason Obama entered this war ostensibly was to, you know, in, in the stated documents was to protect Saudi um, sovereignty. And so if Biden is framing this war again as defensive, then I feel like we're back in 2015 and, and you know, things can just be classified as offensive or defensive arbitrarily. So I really think that what needs to happen is congressional oversight of ending the war. The War Powers Act can be invoked over and over by any member of Congress. And there are things like congressional hearings that need to be taking place. Um, one did take place, by the way, after the CNN investigation, the day after the investigation. But we need to have congressional oversight of this promise, essentially, to end US war in Yemen. The blockade absolutely needs to be lifted unconditionally, not tied to any sort of you know, deal with the Houthis or anything like that. And um, I'm going to urge people to look out for a, a letter that's going to be going to um, elected officials, a congressional letter urging our co congressional officials to sign on to this blockade letter and to ensure that the U.S. works to lift the blockade on Yemen. The war hasn't ended, but when the war ends, when the U.S. stops training and arming and um, fueling every aspect of the war in Yemen, I think reparations are also something that we need to be talking about. You know, aid often is, is discussed, but, um, you know, aid is charity. And what the Yemeni people deserve is reparations at the very least for, in fact, war crimes um, that have been committed and continue to be committed in the name of the U.S. Um, population. So. I'm going to end there, but um, we're going to have plenty of time for question and answer. Um, the panelists will help uh, take the questions from the Q&A, but feel free to reach out to me. I'm on Twitter at Shireen818, where I really only talk about Yemen. Um, and you can also email me. Thank you so much for your time.